Amen. Amen. I want to talk about, I talked about, what do we talk about in the morning? The blessing? The joy of surrender. I want to talk about the blessing of sacrifice. The blessing of sacrifice. And, um, you know, the first person I ever had talk about this was Bishop Doug Hayward Mills. And I was very convicted. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's something that really, really spoke to me. And I thought I'd like to share that with our church today. So, uh, by the way, I um, want to just give a big shout out to Mavuno Kigali. They're watching uh, this. They're having a watch party. And Pastor Mogisha told us that when we had the altar call, one person there raised their hand as well. So we bless God that God is in the house. It's God amazing. Can we just appreciate the Father in heaven? He's such a good God. He loves us. He's calling us to that beautiful place of walking in surrender. You know, every sacrifice releases power. Every sacrifice releases power. We're a modern generation, so we don't know much about sacrifice. But people who live in prehistoric cultures, in ancient cultures, in traditional cultures, they understand the place of sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says something about the message of the cross. The message of the cross is the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus giving up his life. And he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is what? Power. The power of God. The message of the cross. The cross is defeat. The cross is surrender. The cross is giving up the ultimate giving. But to those of us who are being saved, it is power. Power is released. And that's why demonic rituals usually involve some form of sacrifice. Many of you who came, many of you who came from political families in this country, that's one of the places where people understand power. And typically, political families, you'll find when I've prayed for people who come from political families, we do a lot of deliverance. Because there are many assignations and many uh, covenants that politicians enter into with the dark forces dedication even of their families, sacrifices for the sake of power. In the scripture, there's a story about, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 3, about the king of Moab. And basically what happened is Israel was attacking Moab, and they were pressing them hard. These guys were about to lose. They could tell they were about to lose, and they were desperate because they knew these, these Israelites were going to demo demolish them. And they did something. I was always puzzled by this story when I first read it because I wondered, how did this happen? Because it says, when the king of Moab saw that the battle had gone against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through to the king of Edom, but they failed because these guys, their, their allies were also under attack by Israel. Israel is fighting two armies. And they try to break through with his, uh, his toughest swordsmen, and he fails. When he knows things are completely bad, it says, verse 27, he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king, and offered him as a sacrifice on the city wall. And it says, the fury against Israel was great. They withdrew and returned to their own land. What a shock. These are God's people. They are fighting a battle. There's no battle they haven't lo they've lost until this point. They're about to beat these guys. This king takes a demonic sacrifice, kills his own son. I mean, that's the ultimate sacrifice. Kills his own son. And the Bible says the fury against God's people was so great, even them, they said, hey, borrow uh, high. Which in the heavenly language is, we better just leave. We can fight another day. And they went home and left that battle and said, we're not even going to try and beat this one. It's a bit too much. This is the people who are involved in witchcraft. They know this. And, and, and possibly, by the way, um, possibly, I want to just say this because this was very interesting when the certain pastor who explained this, I don't know how true this is, but this is his conviction. Um, and he said, what happened in Malindi? For those of you who are from other countries, there's a cult where, how many people now have, have been found, bodies? Almost 200 bodies have been discovered, and people have been saying, oh, let the church be regulated. Oh, churches are dangerous. 
And what this pastor said, he said uh, in a forum I was in, he said, actually what people don't know is that this Shakahola place was a center of witchcraft. And he said, many, many politicians have gone there to, to receive power. And he said, the bodies that are being discovered, it's not a cult. This is witchcraft. These are sacrifices. And I said, isn't that like the devil's genius? That you would take witchcraft, let it be discovered, the consequences, and then blame the church for it. And now the church is being regulated, but they had nothing to do with it. And this guy, he said, is not a pastor. This is actually witchcraft. And he said, many leading politicians have been to that place. And many leading, he said, even pastors have been there. Because there are many fake pastors who are there to look for power. Because they understand there's something about power. He says, there's sacrifice that comes with power. And this pastor said, what you're seeing is actually sacrifices for the release of, which, of, re, or the release of power, demonic power. A demonic ritual of sacrifice can release so much great power that even God's people say, hey, let's withdraw from this one. You know, the early church, they sacrificed greatly. They sacrificed their wealth for each other. They put their lives on the line for the gospel. They, 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 they gave everything. They didn't hold anything back. And guess what happened? Miracles everywhere. Everywhere there were miracles. You know, it says that in Acts chapter, I think it's Acts 4. Acts 4 verse 32. And it says this. All the believers were one in heart and mind. Let me read this, because this is stuck. This is, this, you know, you can read it without really understanding. This is crazy what this says. What does it say? It says, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. What? Have you ever read that part of the Bible? Like, these were not poor people. These were people who came. Everybody had their, but nobody claimed it as theirs anymore. There was total surrender. And then it says, but they shared everything they had. Verse 33. With, okay, do you, is it me who's, who's seeing my own things? What does it say? With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in all of them, in all of them. Oh my goodness. It's interesting. This power follows something. There's a sacrificial lifestyle. People are giving, people are helping, people are sharing. Great power comes upon the church. You know, the churches in Europe were very powerful in 18th century, 19th century. They're extremely powerful. God used them to bring <laughs> revivals across the whole of Europe. But one of the things that those churches did is they sacrificed. They sent their best. They sent missionaries across the world to difficult places. The average missionary who came to Africa understood that their life expectancy was pretty much zero. They knew they were probably not going back home. And one of the stories I've read is that they would actually pack all their belongings and they would also include among their suitcases a coffin for every member of the family. Because they understood where we are going, we are probably not coming back. There was a giving. They sent, they gave, and they experienced great power. There was power that was released. Unfortunately, we didn't receive the gospel of giving. We received the gospel of receiving. As Africans, we are very good at receiving. When you say a missionary, people think of a white person from another country. Because we don't see ourselves as missionaries. We see ourselves as people who receive missionaries. And could that be a reason why power is not as felt in the church here? Could that be a cause? Because fasting, uh, sorry, uh, power is released through sacrifice. Power is released through sacrifice. It's interesting. We started doing a 21-day fast, liquid fast. Was it two years ago or three years ago? And I remember the first time we did it, people were like, first time we're going to die. I'm so glad Shakahola hadn't happened by that time. I can tell you, people would have left this church. Ah, people would have said, we, Pastor M has finally lost it. He's trying to starve us to death. 
We did our first liquid fast. And God began to work. And we've experienced more miracles in the last two years than we've ever experienced in our whole history. Because power was released with sacrifice. As God's people sacrificed, they began to experience God's power flowing in different ways than they'd ever experienced. And you know, it's very easy for you to take for granted. When God starts to move, it's easy to forget how it was when God wasn't moving. It's easy for us to forget how it was when God wasn't answering prayers in our compass the way he is now. It's very easy. But that's not where we used to be. We had a very different expectation on God's power. And now we've come to assume God's power in a sense because God is working. But there's a sacrifice that we're learning to give. You know, it's very interesting. Jesus never traveled far from his hometown. I mean, the man from Galilee only went to Jerusalem, which was within the same country. Never went, never went on an international mission, was never on a billboard, never spoke on, on radio or TV, never had a branding team managing his campaigns. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about him. People are still giving their lives in their thousands every day to follow him to follow him. But what is it about Jesus? Was it his sermons? Other people have preached. Was it his miracles? There have been miracles other places. Was it how long he did ministry? Actually, his time of ministry was this short compared to most pastors. But there's one thing that Jesus did. He was nailed on a cross. He gave the ultimate sacrifice that other people would be saved. And today, our lives are still being changed because sacrifice releases power. Sacrifice releases power. Obedience and sacrifice will bear more fruit than anything you will ever do. You know, people take you seriously when they know that you're willing to sacrifice anything. Yeah, governments don't mess with suicide bombers. These guys are only 18, 21, but entire intelligence agencies operate to try and... Conf I mean, this is not the government of Russia we're talking about. This is not a, a foreign government. We're talking about individual little young people who are willing to put on a bomb and blow themselves up. And they cause nightmares, and countries take them seriously. And you'd imagine that when they blow themselves up, other people would say, what stupidity is this? And nobody would ever join their cause. But on the contrary... The more they've blown themselves up, the more young people have signed up to join them. What is happening there? Sacrifice. It releases power. People take you seriously when they know you're willing to sacrifice anything. You know, it's very interesting that in the same way for us, the Bible calls us to put our bodies on the altar as a living sacrifice. And there's a power that is released when you're on that altar. There's a power that is released when you're willing to put your body on the altar. And the enemy knows. The enemy knows the power of sacrifice. He understands the spiritual power that you possess if you're willing to sacrifice. So the enemy will do anything to keep you from sacrificing. He will do anything to make your life not be that serious. For you not to take your sacrifice that seriously. And he's going to use many different forces. I'm going to mention three this morning. Three different forces that the enemy will use to keep you from sacrificing. The first is the Antichrist spirit. The Antichrist spirit. It's interesting because Daniel, the prophet, had a vision. And he saw a vision of times that were to come. And he saw the vision of uh, an army that would come led by somebody who he saw as really an Antichrist. And one of the things he says in Daniel 11.31 he says something about it. He says, his armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress. And what will they do? They will abolish the daily sacrifice. And they will set up an abomination that causes desolation. Now, historically, they tell us this actually happened. There was a monarch called Antiochus Epiphanes who uh, ruled after Alexander the Great. He was one, when Alexander's empire was split into four, he took one part. The part that he took uh, was the one in charge of Palestine. The Jews were his enemies. He came and crushed them. And then he put, uh, he, he came and actually had them, they, he slaughtered pigs inside the temple because he knew that this was just abominable for the Jews. 
he banished sacrifices. And he basically just killed anything to do with temple worship and especially sacrifice. This man, he understood that these guys, without sacrifice, they're nothing. Without sacrifice, they're nothing. This is what Daniel was predicting. But you know, it's very interesting because I believe, and what you're going to find about prophecy, if you study prophecies, one of the things they say about biblical prophecies, biblical prophecies are secular. They have a way that they talk about things that happened in the time to come. They actually happened, but they will happen again. So if you read some of the, para, the, the, the prophecies, you're going to find that, yes, the book of Revelation affirms Antiochus came, because this was written after Antiochus, but it still talks about the Antichrist. So this was predicting a time that was about to come in their lifetime or just after their lifetime. But after that, at the end of time, these things are still being fulfilled. The Bible is still relevant. No prophecies in it, by the way, are outdated. Everything in it is, has happened and will happen. And so in this thing, the Bible, the Revelation tells us that the Antichrist will come. This same, this same Antichrist will come. And I believe today we're experiencing the effect of the Antichrist spirit in our culture. Because the one thing that the spirit of the Antichrist does is attack any notion of sacrifice. The spirit of the age is antagonistic to people going to church. Like, how do you waste your time? The spirit of the age is antagonistic to people doing God's work. The, the spirit of the age is antagoni antagonistic to people giving money to God's work. You think about it. It's not cool to be a Christian in the time we live in. It's not cool to be a religious person, to be seen as somebody who has faith. To be seen as somebody who gives. If you tell, if you told your, by the way, if you told your people, I gave a, a month salary to my church, what would they say? <laughs> Quickly, they've already written you off. You cannot be a clever person. You must be daft. There's something wrong with you. There's a spirit of the antichrist. It's it's ruling in the world today. It's ruling in the world today. Uh, the whole notion. I mean, you look at someone like Daniel in his time. He prayed how many times a day? Three times every day he would go to his house and kneel down and face Jerusalem and pray. He was a busy civil servant in charge of most of the nation. But three times he would never stop. He would go, kneel, pray. How many Christians do you know who take over their lunch break, they just shut down everything and they kneel and pray? They face Hill City. <laughs> How many Christians do you know who do that? Because today we don't live in an age of sacrifice. We live in the age of the Antichrist. And people who sacrifice are seen as fanatical. They're seen as being religious. They're seen as being, they've lost something here. They're seen as being ignorant, not scientific. People look down on you because of the spirit of the Antichrist. And when you feel like giving up something for God, the spirit of the Antichrist will be the first opposition that you will face. The second force that the enemy comes against sacrifice with is those with hidden agendas. Those with hidden agendas. You know, John 12, verse 3 to 5, tells us a very interesting story about one of Jesus' disciples. His name was Judas. And it tells us about a young lady called Mary who took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. I mean, this was a very expensive perfume. And what happens next tells you about this person. Mary, uh, one of his disciples, Jesus, uh, of Jesus, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, <coughs> objected. Objection. <laughs> because verse 5, what does he say? He says, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Just plan. Hold on right there. A year's salary. Just extrapolate your salary right now. And then buy a perfume. And then break it and wash Pastor Kilonzi's feet. <laughs> verse 6. What do you say, verse 6? Verse 6. Come on, let's go. Are you there? Verse 6. Come on, verse 6. They don't have it, huh? All right, so verse 6, let me say this. Actually, it was verse 5. It says, he did not say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. 
a keeper of the money bag, and he used to help himself to what was put into it. Oh man, we should have given that money to the poor. It was so much. But this guy had different agendas. He was stealing. And he knew now that that money, that money has been used and poured on Jesus' feet, there's no chance for him to slice something out of it. And that's why he's protesting, because he has a hidden agenda. You know, when you start to sacrifice to God, there will be those who will oppose your sacrifice because of what they stand to lose. Yeah. There are people who benefit from your lack of a sacrificial lifestyle. There are people who benefit from the fact that you always have cash. And they hang us on. Some of them might even be relatives or good friends. There's a good life you afford them because of your lack of a sacrificial lifestyle. And they will oppose you when you sacrifice. There are others who don't want you to sacrifice because it's pressure. What are you saying about the rest of us? Huh? You're making us look bad. At you fasted for how many days? You didn't hear Pastor M said seven. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Pastor James? Huh? Why are you fasting 14? Can you think you're more spiritual than the rest of us? <laughs> huh? Can you think you're going to get a double portion than us? Yeah. There are people who will actually feel bad that you're sacrificing. Why are you giving your fast food? Because huh? you gave last year. Yeah. Why? They have their own agenda. And they will try to keep you from sacrificing. And the devil will use their voices to slow you down, to cause you to come back to a comfortable place, not a place of sacrifice. The third force that the enemy is use, will use is those who love you. Those who love you. These ones genuinely love you. There's a man who genuinely loved Jesus. And Jesus was determined to sacrifice. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And on the third day, he'd be raised to life. Jesus was ready to sacrifice. But verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. What did Jesus tell him? Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> Get thee behind me. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, Peter wasn't a bad guy. Peter didn't hate Jesus. Peter had no ulterior motives. Peter's only concern was to protect Jesus from pain. He could see what this sacrifice could cost Jesus. And he's like, I love you too much to let this happen to you. And he, out of his concern, he decided to stop him. But you know, many in their concern allow the devil to stand in the way of our sacrifice and what God is doing. I remember when my wife and I were students in the U.S. and we finished our studies. And we had declared, we're only here to study because we're going back home, we feel God has called us to go and help Nairobi Chapel, the church we worked in. We were very clear. This is why we came. I don't think anybody believed us. When we finally finished and we started proclaiming it, we had opposition from every quarter. I remember one of my fellow students, he was Korean, and he knew that I had been given two very envious uh, opportunities uh, by two different professors. They had offered me a, an opportunity to be there. <laughs> They offered me an opportunity to be their tutorial fellow, which was a full-time job, a fully paid job that would pay for my PhD. Two different ones. By the way, I'm the only one in the school who got that. I was actually top student. Okay, sorry, I shouldn't say this. <laughs> so I was, I was top student in the school. So these two professors applied me, uh, uh, asked me if I would serve them. And I was talking about my del with, with my friend, and I was saying, I don't know, I'm going to have to let them down. And my Korean friend was livid. He was angry. He said, you're from Africa. You don't understand. These things don't happen any time. Even me, I would love to be given this opportunity. You need to take it. And I remember I told him, uh, but you know what? That's, no, I didn't tell him, get thee behind me. I wish I had, though. That would have been a good thing to say. But I remember telling him, you know what? God has told us we're going back. You know what he told me? He told me, you're very stupid. 
I'll never forget that, by the way. Nobody had ever told me that. He told me, let me just tell you lovingly, you're very stupid. You're throwing your life away. You're very stupid. I remember the church we had started because we, we, we founded a church when we were there. And by the way, did you know I started a, we started a church with Pastor Carol? We, had, we planted a church in California. And I still remember the day I took a team from Mavuno there. You know, the look of betrayal they gave me was like, we didn't know our father had another family. <laughs> so, <laughs> by the way, they looked shocked. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'll never forget that day. Anyway, this church, they actually summoned us. Then the elders sat us down and they said, it's not God's will. It cannot be God's will. You know, at that time, all the planes leaving Kenya were full. So the days that the line around the American embassy went like twice. It's like everybody was trying to leave the country. And the planes coming back were empty. You could sleep across the whole plane. That's exactly what we did coming back, by the way. And I remember them telling us, you, you cannot. This is not God. This is the devil. You need to actually reconsider. God wants you here. But I remember thinking, if God can look after us in America, Kwani, how limited is our God? <laughs> if he can look after us here, he can look after us in Kenya as well. But you know, it was not because they were malicious or because they hated us. It's because they loved us. They wanted the best for us. I've had in, enough experiences because I've had the opportunity, like Pastor Oscar did for me, to call many young people and say, I believe God wants you to serve him. And I remember I've talked to some of, some of them and their parents have detested me, I think. I mean, some of them have just did not agree with the decision because their, their, their kids were smart. They were the brightest. They thought they'd be engineers. They thought they'd be other things. Pastor James, I'm not talking, I'm not looking at you. And, 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 and it's like, we've, we've not educated you so you can throw your life away serving God. That's a sentiment you get from a lot of people. Not because they hate their children, but because they love them. And many times, those who love you the most will be the ones who stand in your way the most of you doing what God is calling you to do. You know, it's very interesting because I always find ironically that the same parents would not protest if their child got called to work for the UN in a war zone. They wouldn't. They'd be, they, in fact, they'd be talking, our son works for the UN. Where? Afghanistan. <laughs> He's paid a lot of money. <laughs> huh? He's paid a lot of money, and they're very proud of that son. But serving the Lord, that's throwing your life away. Sacrificing for God, that's throwing your life away. I, I mean, it's so interesting because there are many professionals and business people who trade their lives. They, they, they give up their time. They sacrifice time with their children. Save times with their, in their marriages. They sacrifice their marriages on the altar of career. But you tell those same people to sacrifice their life for God, they think you're crazy. Yeah. We all understand sacrifice. It's just that we don't think God is worth sacrificing to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in his last temptation, Satan offered Jesus a shortcut. Basically, what he was saying is, dude, I know your plan. I know why you've come. Aha. I know why you came. There's a plan you're here for. You want to take over this world. You want to return this world back to God. You want to take the world. But I have a plan. And it's a painless plan. It will not involve sacrifice. Just kneel down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. In 35 seconds. It's yours. Pastor George, you're feeling me. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think of Jesus, you're thinking about nails you're thinking about crowns of thorns. You're thinking about insults. You're thinking about the most pain you can ever imagine. Life dying, dying, shame. And this guy is saying, all you do, worship me, it's yours. But I thank God that Jesus knew the power of sacrifice. He knew that there's nothing he was going to gain if he did not sacrifice. Please don't agree to be fooled by Satan's soft life plan for you. Yeah. Yeah. Satan has a soft life plan for you. It's a plan that does not entail any sacrifice. 
It's a plan that entails you being comfortable. That's his plan for your life. Be comfortable the rest of your life. And it's a very attractive plan. But listen, God did not call you to live a comfortable life. He called you to live a dangerous life. Satan knows that. That's why he wants to stop you. And there are many books in Christian bookshops that are full of how to live a comfortable life. How to have a comfortable marriage. How to have a comfortable home. How to have everything comfortable around you. God did not call you. Tell your neighbor, God did not call you to live a comfortable life. He called you to live a dangerous life. Yeah. And that's why Satan wants to stop you. Satan wants to stop you from living a dangerous life. He knows it's dangerous to himself. I love how John and James, they, they want power. <laughs> the disciples, they want power. It's like Jesus, me and my brother. I think they were relatives or something because the audacity. In fact, in one of the Gospels, they even get auntie. Like Jesus says, auntie. By the way, when your auntie talks to you, respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mom has something she wants to tell you. <laughs> hey, mom, it's not mom. We have discussed in the kitchen. We know what we are coming to tell you. Jesus, you know now we are family. This global kingdom, how are your relatives being left behind? It's like a job. You need people you can trust around you. You need, you need a, and our family can't be left behind. You can't be employing people from Siju, which village, and our people you're not employing. Mom has come to do an application for her children. And she's even told them, you relax, I'll talk to him. By the way, in fact, when his mother wasn't breastfeeding, it's me who was holding him. So I know him. This one will listen to me. And it's like, our sons, they, my son needs to, one sits here, the other one sits here. But what does Jesus ask them? He says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Yeah. You want the power, but you don't want the sacrifice. You want the position, but you're not willing to pay for it. There's a price to be paid. And many times we want a particular grace, we want a particular anointing in our lives. We pray for God's power to be seen in our lives. We want God to do miracles in us and through us. We want our lives to be fearless and to impact people across generations. We want to live significant lives. But we're not willing to pay the price. We're not willing to pay the price. You know what distinguishes God is people who are willing. Uh, what distinguishes the people who God uses are the people who are willing to sacrifice. Just think about it. Anybody that God has used greatly has been willing to sacrifice. I, I always am struck by the story of Elisha. That when Elijah comes and puts his mantle on him and says, you're the one who's going to become my successor. Instantly the boy knows this thing, it's a big thing. And what does he do? He takes the cattle that he's plowing with. He kills them. He uses the plowing equipment. This is his business, by the way, the thing he has invested. He takes that equipment, uses it to light the fire, to roast the cows. Not, for a sac not that he, so that he can worship God. He feeds the workers. And he's basically symbolizing them to them. Guys, I've decided. It's over. I'm following. I'm willing to pay the cost. Elisha was the most powerful prophet Israel ever saw. I mean, Elisha is the one guy who did miracles that only Jesus ever did. Even when he's dead, by the way. You know, there's a crazy story where Elijah, his bones. <laughs> so there's a guy who's killed, and, and his friends throw him in a place. They don't even know it's a tomb of the prophet. It's so many years later, they, they don't even know. And it's very possible because if you go to Israel, one of the things about Israel that's so shocking and I know you're all going to go to Israel in Jesus' name. You're going to be shocked when you go because everything that happens in the Bible happens in one little province like Nairobi. It's shocking. Like you're going to find the same place Abraham sacrificed his son is the same place Solomon built the temple is the same place that Jesus was being tried. It's like they all happen within a very small space. So these guys have even forgotten where Elisha was buried because it's so many years later and they throw a body in a, in a cave. And this body contacts his, his bones. Boom. And the body just comes back to life. Poof. As in the miracle working power is still in the bones. Years after the guy is dead. There's power. There's anointing. With sacrifice. With sacrifice. And what will keep many churches small is lack of sacrifice. What will keep many discipleship groups 
from ever impacting his lack of sacrifice. What will keep many Christians living ordinary and mediocre lives is lack of sacrifice. I don't know if you know this, but in every seed is a potential forest. Every time you hold a seed like this, it's tiny. But inside that seed, there is the God has put in something called DNA. And that DNA has the potential to put every forest you see actually came out of a seed. But here's the thing. That seed will never become a forest if it stays the same way it is. Isn't it? Something has to change. It's interesting because John 12, 24, Jesus says, very truly. By the way, Jesus would say some things which he prefaced with, truly, truly, or very truly, or verily I say, <laughs> very truly I tell you. And imagine God himself is like, this is not just true, very true. Unless a kernel of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So what happens to that seed? It has to go into the ground. It has to lose its shape. Maybe it was a beautiful seed. It was a mango seed. It was luscious. It was round, an avocado seed. Oh yeah, avocado seeds are amazing. Huh? It's round, it's luscious, it looks amazing, it has a shape. But for that thing to ever become a tree or a forest, actually it's going to shrivel. It's going to lose its shape. It's going to decay. It's going to be in the dark. It's going to be desolate. And it's going to be there for a while. But eventually, because it has died, because literally it dies, it's, it's, it's not going to re remain the same. It will be a completely different thing by the time this process of crushing is finished. But what will come out is a tree that will bear many, many, many more avocados. Any of you have an avocado tree in your shags? Any of you have those trees which they can produce so many fruits you don't even know what to do with? You just give the neighbors. In fact, you even have too many. You don't even, you put them in your bags. You, it's like you can't even get rid of those things. You give them to cows. Anybody has those trees? Yeah. But that tree came out of one seed that was willing to die. I know God has called us, Mavuno, to be the fearless. I know our vision is to start churches across the world. It's to become those fearless people who live an impact in our generation. I know that for many of you, your names are going to be remembered long after you're gone. I believe that many of you, you'll have such an impact, your families will never be the same. This is God's intention for us. That we are people who make a difference. We're not going to live mediocre lives. Tell your neighbor, you will not live a mediocre life. You can't. Not in this family. Not in this family. But let me say this. We can't do what God is asking us to do unless people are willing to sacrifice. Unless you're willing to sacrifice. I'm hearing very few amens in the house right now. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the story I shared at family night about the pastor who wanted the church to fly. <laughs> Pastors, this church is going to fly. Let it fly, let it fly. This church is going to soar. Let it soar, let it soar. This church is going to cruise. Let it cruise, let it cruise. But for it to cruise, we need sacrifice. Let it walk, let it walk. It's okay, we can walk. We are fine walking. We are fine, we can even crawl. Because nobody wants to sacrifice. You know, in this church, for us to become the global movement God is calling us to be, that it's going to change the world. Every single person in this room needs to lead a discipleship group. I told you, let it, let it, let it walk. Let it crawl. <laughs> Muliskia, when I said you're all going to be rich and you're all going to change the world, you're all, amen, amen. You will all sacrifice your house to lead a discipleship group. <laughs> we can't have the glory if we're not willing for our lives to be part of that story, people. We have to be willing to sacrifice. We're going to need people to open their homes to start a viewing center. Yeah. By the way, you don't need to be an expert to do this. Oh, Irene came. Where is Irene? Is she here? Irene from Diani. Yeah, she's there. Just stand and wave. That's our pastor in Diani. 
That beautiful lady there. Yeah. <laughs> she looks like a model, but she was, it's because she wasn't trained to be a pastor. She was trained to be something else. But now her house is leading people to Jesus. Yeah. But she sacrificed her. Huh? Most people like to have their house a certain way on Sundays. She doesn't have that anymore. She's giving it up in order to see that place becoming transformed to what God wants it to be. Nobody trained her to be a pastor. But don't worry, we'll train you on the job. We'll train you on the job. And as you figure it out, we'll be figuring it out with you. But somebody has to be willing to sacrifice. Your sacrifice is what will bring people to Jesus. It's what will bring people to Jesus. We're going to need to see people giving up their jobs as tools for the expansion of God's kingdom. Some of you need to understand that that job is a gift by God. And it's for the sake of expanding his kingdom. And God wants to bless you. But you're holding on to that job like it's yours. And the minute you say, God, this is your job. I want you to use it. I will sacrifice it for you. It's yours. You know, sometimes we don't want to say that in case, what if he takes it away from me? But you know what happens? Sometimes when, he, when, you, when you give it up to him, he actually gives it back to you in spades. He gives you the ability to use it as a tool for the kingdom of God. And you begin to understand that your job is actually an expansion tool for God's kingdom. Your car is an expansion tool for God's kingdom. Your house is an expansion tool for God's kingdom. Your relationships and networks are an expansion tool for God's kingdom. God wants to, you to use everything in your life and sacrifice it to him that he can use it to glorify himself in your generation. You know, it's interesting. By the way, this one is going to be much shorter. Something puzzled me, and I, I don't understand. And I'm saying this because I actually don't understand. Um, it's never happened in Mavuno, so I didn't understand it. So last year when we asked for people in Mavuno Church to give their fast fruits, Free the Future, I think we called it, we had pledges of about 80 million which was amazing. And I think we raised about 40-something of that, which is always interesting for me because my pastor friends have told me, actually, half your people always make the pledge out of emotion but have no plan to carry it through. So they say, that's fantastic. Uh, the fact that you had 80 million and 40 million. And in my life, I was like, praise God, we're starting. These are the days of small beginnings. We're going from glory to glory. God's about to take us to the next level. This church is about to soar. This church is about to fly. Come on, somebody. <laughs> what a shock. So we come back to 2023. And the pledges are exactly half of what they were last year. It was 40 million. And we've been able to get about 25 of that. And I was confused. I went back to the, my prayer closet to ask God, God, what is it? How do people give half of what they gave last year. Is it that the people were expecting some magic and they were disappointed when you didn't multiply their money? Was it that I lied to them? Maybe they had my story and they thought, oh, there's something here, I didn't tell them the fine print, that when you sacrifice a fast food, God has not guaranteed you'll get a promotion, that it's not magic, it's not manipulation. I said, God, is it that I didn't teach it correctly? What is it that I didn't do? By the way, God hasn't answered yet. <laughs> he hasn't told me what's happening. But I'm in, I'm in shock, honestly. I was surprised because I thought people would respond with joy and sacrifice. You know, the funny thing is, the people who know their God, they're still sacrificing. They're still doing it. So I'm throwing this out as a, in fact, I put that on my notes and I wonder, should I say it? It's a point of weakness. It's a point of confusion. I've never gotten there as a leader where I'm like, okay, what happened? And maybe some of you have answers. By the way, if you have an answer to this one, I'd be very happy to hear it. You can even see me afterwards. You don't have to, if you don't want to talk now. But what happened? Is it the economy became crazy? I don't understand. I honestly don't. But what I'm saying, guys, is there's never been any advance of God's kingdom without sacrifice. In the early days of Mavuno Church, we were in a place called South Sea Sports Club. And there was about 400 of us. And God called us to move. How many of you were there when we were moving to Bellevue? Let me just see. Show of hands. Just wave it up. Wave it up. Yeah, I can see there's several of them in the room. 
These guys, by the way, the reason I'm asking them to put up their hands, they sacrificed. I remember we took two years to raise money to move to Bellevue. We needed to raise 30 million Kenya shillings. This was way back in 2009 or something. It was so much money. We had never even imagined money like that. We were a young church. Most of us were in our first jobs or second jobs. And I remember the first year, I challenged people. I said, guys, let's, let's give equivalent to one month's salary. And we gave it. It wasn't enough. And then we said, okay, the next year, let's give anything the Lord tells you. <laughs> I was like, All right, okay, God, just maybe it's me who's limiting people. Give the number that God puts you in your mind. And I still remember, some of you remember that I think maybe four or five men or, or families gave about a million shillings each. They pledged to give, by the way, they didn't have it. And all of them came through and gave their pledges. And my family, by the way, was one of them. Huh? And I remember how crazy I was in shock that people could actually, because that was a lot of money back. It's still a lot of money even today. But it was a lot of money back then. Because of the sacrifice of those people, the day we moved to Bellevue, I still remember in one month that we were 400 people when we arrived. By the end of the month, we were 1,600 people. By the next month, end of the next month, we were 2,500 people. And I always think the sacrifice release that blessing. There's something about those people's sacrificial giving that allowed this church to become what it became after that. And I believe that the Lord will always reward that. The Lord will always remember that sacrifice. To come to Hill City, many of you have come to church uh, uh, after. Many of you say that you've come in the 2020s. I mean, the fact that this movement exists is because a bunch of people in that church called Bellevue gave beyond belief beyond what they would have imagined possible for us to buy this land. And let me tell you something. I think we were about maybe 12 churches. No, six churches. I remember I was watching a video. We were about six churches when we were fundraising to come here. Today, we are probably 30, 36 churches. And we are poised to, we're about to become 100 churches. And I believe none of that would be possible if not for the sacrifice of those people who gave at Bellevue for us to exist here today. By the way, I believe the churches you're in, there are some of these campuses here that are going to become like foundational churches for your city. Some of the churches, many of our campuses here, even those who are, of you who are listening, there are campuses in Mavuno that are going to become foundational campuses. The city will actually, spiritually, you will control your cities. The influence around the cities, the culture of these cities will be determined by many of the campuses in this room. Yeah. But I can tell you this. It will not happen unless people are willing to sacrifice. It will take a lot of sacrifice to get us to become everything that God wants us to be. God is going to ask you to make a sacrifice. And for some of you, God may ask you to change many things in your life. Your expenditure, your behavior with money. Just like for Abraham, he might ask you to give up things that are precious to you. He may ask you to give up things and he may even ask you to, to, he may ask you to, to, to take up things that you're not ready to take up. But here's the beauty, God's promise, God's call to sacrifice always comes with a promise. It always comes with a promise. I love that about God. He will never ask you to sacrifice something without a promise. I love that in Abraham's time, our, our forefather, that in Genesis chapter 12, when he calls Abraham, he says, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. That's, the, that's such a crazy sacrifice. He's saying, leave your comfort zone. Leave your friends. Leave your networks. Leave your family, your extended family. Leave everything you've ever known. And then he says, go to the land I will show you. He doesn't even tell him which land, by the way. Like, don't you hate how God doesn't tell you everything? It's like he's telling you to step, but you don't know exactly where, where are you stepping, what will happen when you step, who will you find there? It's like, just go, and I will show you. But here's what God says in verse 2. He says, I will make you into a great nation. Tell your neighbor, you're going to become a great nation. Yeah. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. 
all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Who would like to have that kind of promise from God? <laughs> yeah. Now, here's the thing. Promises or wealth is always by inheritance. Wealth that is given to parents is always for their children. Remember the song we used to sing in Sunday school? Father Abraham, many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just... Oh, come on, somebody. There's such theology in that song. Such deep theology. The first thing it's telling you is that you're a son of that covenant. This promise of Abraham is yours through inheritance. And you know, I love the fact that it doesn't say, I'm one of them and so are you, so let's start working hard for God. <laughs> it says we do what? We receive it. We just praise the Lord. Because it's given. You don't have to work for an inheritance. It's yours. Can we read that promise again? Genesis, just go back to verse 1. Uh, verse 2. Verse, verse 2. Uh, can we read it together? Because this is your promise. Okay. Now read it like it's the will that is being read. It's the portion that talks about you. Your rich, 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 great, no, your rich grandfather has died. And the will is being read. And you're sitting there. And you're reading the part that concerns you. Is your heart beating a bit? Because you're waiting to hear, what was I left for? Come on, let's read it together. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. Come on, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of earth will be blessed through you. Come, somebody say, I receive. That's your blessing. That's your inheritance. That's who God wants you to be. That's who he intends for you to be. That you will become a great nation. You will become a great blessing. The earth is going to be blessed through you. People that you don't even know are going to call on you. People are going to say, that is my ancestor. Because of that person, I exist. You will meet children of yours, yours in other countries that you didn't even know. <laughs> you will. You will. You know, let me tell you a secret. When I go to places, when I, when, one of the reasons I love, I love visiting Mavuno churches in other countries is because I meet my children who I have never met. I meet people who tell me, Pastor, I am you're my father. I've never talked to them. But my life has had an impact on them. I'm a son of Abraham, people. I'm living the promise. And that is your promise as well. It's your promise as well. I will bless you and make you great. And you know, the thing about it is, as you choose to sacrifice your life, as you choose to sacrifice your resources, as you choose to sacrifice your time, as you choose to sacrifice everything for the sake of the gospel, oh my goodness, you will become a blessing. You will become a blessing. You will unlock the blessings of your forefather Abraham. Abraham was known as a friend of God. He was known as a blessed man. I mean, that is an unfair blessing. Isn't that an unfair blessing? I will bless those who bless you and those who curse you, I'll curse. In other words, God is, God is telling you, I am on your side. Anyone who comes against you is now my enemy. That's an unfair blessing. Because I'm thinking, what about Abraham's, the guy who was coming against Abraham? See, even him, he was created by God. But God has said, no, it is you that I'm choosing to bless. It's an unfair blessing. But remember, Abraham, he's the man who received the most precious gift he could have received from God. The only son. And God said, take your son, Isaac, whom you love, and sacrifice him to me. God wasn't doing this because he was cruel is because he knew this man needs to unlock a power that will have generational impact throughout all eternity. And the only way that power will be released is through his ultimate sacrifice. Abraham doesn't even know this, but he understands everything I have is surrendered. And so he tells his son Isaac, hey, hey son, tomorrow we're going to sacrifice to God. Isaac's like, yay, I've always wanted to go and sacrifice. He's like, why isn't dad excited? He's like, Sawa, let's go. And the whole way he's like, dad, this is awesome. This is awesome. Where are the animals? <laughs> and Abraham is weeping inside because he knows that this thing is costing him. But he knows he committed and he surrendered and everything belongs to God. And finally he tells his son, you are 
the sacrifice. I'm about to bind you and to do what nobody has ever done to his son. I'm about to kill you on the altar. I mean, the story of the Bible is insane. Think about it for those of you who have children. That's a crazy story. Anywhere. It sounds very cruel. And so he ties up his son and he puts him on the altar. He puts the stick ar sticks around him and he's sharpened the knife and he's getting ready to do the thing that is about to rob him of the love of his life. I wonder if at that point he thought, when this guy dies, I die as well. We might as well be dead. But it's like God has asked me. God has a reason. And he's sharpening the knife. And at that point, he takes his son. And just before he strikes him, God says, Stop, Abraham. Stop, Abraham. I've seen a man who loves me. I've seen a man who's willing to give up everything for me. And he says, The Lord has provided. And the Lord provides a ram. And Abraham sacrifices that ram. Sacrifices that ram. And right now today where the temple mount stands is the same place where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son. A great nation came out of this man. People have been blessed throughout. And in heaven, people will continue to be blessed. Anybody in heaven will be a son of Abraham. But it took sacrifice. Ask your neighbor, are you ready to sacrifice? Yeah. Let me just invite us to stand. I know today has been a little heavy. Hopefully the afternoon will be a bit lighter. Tell your neighbor, hopefully the afternoon will be a bit lighter. <laughs> God is doing something in Mavuno Church right now. And I can see it. Who we are right now is not who we were a year ago. Who we will be this time next year is not who we are right now. God is in the process of preparing a vessel that he will use, a noble vessel. I believe that God is about to do something in this church that the nations will be blessed by. Mark those words. I speak them prophetically right now. God is about to do something through you that the nations will be blessed by. And you will have a part in it, an important part of it. God is about to release your best work. God is about to show you why he created you. God is about to lead you into such joy that you never even imagined you could experience. Some of you are going to look back to this meeting today and say, as pastor was speaking, I didn't even understand what he was saying. Because God is about to do something amazing in your life. But I sense that what God is saying is, will you sacrifice it? It means nothing if it's held in your hand. It's a seed. A seed is beautiful, but you can't do much with it. Maybe if it's a seed that you can eat, there are seeds you can eat, but you eat it and it's consumed and it's finished, and what about tomorrow? But when that seed dies, it will provide for generations. And I sense that God is saying, I want you to sacrifice. I will not be able to release power in your life, that power you're asking for, unless you're willing to sacrifice. Unless that house, you're willing to sacrifice it for my use. You're willing to sacrifice your time for me. You're willing to sacrifice your inconvenience and, and be inconvenienced for me. I sense this is what the Lord is saying, people. Am I a little afraid of this message? Yes. I am a little afraid. Because sacrifice is never easy. But I'm also excited. Because I believe this is what we've been praying for. Those of you who raised your hand that you've been here for years, this is what we've been praying for this church for many years. Pastor Molly, this is what we've been praying for this church. Maurice Bolivar, this is what we've been praying. Those early days at the club when we'd pray, this is what we were praying for. This season is what we were praying for. And God is about to release His power among us if we will just sacrifice. Without power, without sacrifice, there is no power. But I believe the Lord is calling us right now to say, I will follow. I will follow. I will follow my King. No half measures. No half measures. No half measures. I am all in. My Father, I speak over your people right now. I don't know what you're putting in their spirits, even as they listen. But Lord, here's, your, here's, here's, here's the beginning, the first fruits. 
of thousands upon thousands. Even just their willingness to sacrifice a Saturday and to come and just spend time learning from you. Lord, you see it. There are others who wouldn't do this. There are others who would rather be making money or doing other things. But these ones have said, I'm willing. I know people here who've cancelled business appointments so they could be here. I know people here who cancelled trips and travel so they could be here. I know people here who paid for their transport to come from other towns so they could be here. Come on, Mavuno Nakuru. I see you in the house. Bless God for you. Come on, Mavuno Diani. We see you in the house. Bless God for you. Wherever you are, the Lord sees it. He sees it. May your sacrifice release power. The power that you've been waiting for from the Lord. May He lead you into a lifestyle of sacrifice. You know, there's that song that, that was playing earlier about by Danson. He says, Accept this living sacrifice. I am your worship. I am your worship. And I sense that as Lord, as people are standing in front of you right now, this is what they're saying. Lord, I am a living sacrifice. Ah, Lord, I want to be a sacrifice. You know, my children, I've dedicated them to you. They will serve you all their life because they're yours. <laughs> I don't want my children to run after their own things. I want them to run after you like I've run after you. My house is yours. Any house you give me, Lord, will be used for ministry. It is yours. Lord, any possession you give me will be used for ministry. It is yours. Even my money, Lord, when you give it to me, I will ask you first, what is this money for? Because it's yours. Lord, send me to nations. By the way, I'm just showing you how to pray. Start to pray. Lord, send me to nations. Lord, use me to glorify yourself. I want to burn for you. I want to burn for you. Father God, receive the prayers of your children right now as they're just making that commitment and saying, Lord, I will serve you. I will follow you. I will burn for you. Father, I know that you're here. Your presence is hovering in this room. And even as we pray this thing, I know, I know you're hearing us. And so, Lord, we release ourselves to you right now. We say, use us. I sense that today, Lord, is a covenant-making day. That, Lord, you've already drawn near to us, but now we are drawing near to you. Some of us have been running away from you for a long time. But today we are coming back and we're saying, Lord, I'm going to walk close to you. I'm not going to run away from you. My family is yours. Use it to glorify yourself. My marriage is yours. Use it to glorify yourself. And Lord Jesus, I see a, I see a dedicated army here. I see people with sincere hearts here longing to serve you. And I'm praying, Lord, that they will not be disappointed. Nobody here will say, I sacrificed and I did not see the power of the Lord in my life but that every single one of them today will leave with something from you just because of their open hearts and willingness to be that living sacrifice. And so God's people, prepare yourself for God to move because God is going to move. And He's already moving right now. He's already moving right now. Lord, even as we're here, I just pray, heal somebody right now. There's someone who's been even, as they're dedicating themselves to you, who came with an ailment, came in pain. Lift that pain, Lord. Ah, that is your living sacrifice, Lord. Remove that pain. Heal them that they will be able to testify today that the Lord is healing. I sense that the Lord is healing somebody right now. Yeah. I sense somebody has an arm that has been in pain. <laughs> and the Lord is just delivering you right now. He's healing. He's healing because he's a good God and is a faithful God. Lord, we are looking forward today to seeing an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this place. We are hungry for you. We desire you. We want only what you want for us. And so, Lord, even as we have our lunch now, I pray that you'd nourish our bodies and prepare us for an afternoon of ministry. Prepare us to hear your word in power. Prepare us to encounter Jehovah. Lord, we are here at a nexus of heaven and earth. Your angels are already here. They're ascending and descending. I testify to that. 
And I pray, Lord Jehovah, that you would heal your people today. They would encounter you in life-changing ways. And so, Father, we love you and we bless you. We acknowledge there's no power without sacrifice. And that's why we say, Lord, here we are as a living sacrifice. We bless you and we honor you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray and God's people say it. Amen. Amen.